We started off with um, a number of uh, R words that um, lie at the basis of our discussions. Repair, reparations, redress, restoration, restitution, reconciliation, let us add some more. Return, remembering, the social organization of remembering. Um, and in some ways, South Africa has been a laboratory for all of these processes, all of which raise all kinds of political questions, as we have heard. Um, and you will know that uh, in, the, in the last months of the uh, negotiations in the transition to democracy, so-called in South Africa, uh, the generals put on the agenda the idea of a sunset clause that uh, out of which the Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, emerged. And um, all, all of you will be aware of some of the debates around the, the value of the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, about its emphasis on gross violations of human rights as what came to define apartheid, excluding the everyday operations of daily uh, aspects uh, of, of apartheid, with apartheid being defined by, uh, by massacres and by murders and by mutilation. And consequently, perpetrators were defined as those who committed such acts. And of course, that raised questions of um, where does that leave beneficiation? Who are the beneficiaries uh, of apartheid? Because you, have, you already have a, a born free generation who feel that they bear no responsibility for, for any of this. Um, of course, this was um, a, a situation that, about which was argued that it generated certain truths, certain evidence of the past in exchange for amnesty. Um, and we know, of course, that, um, that the, the outcome of the TRC, it has been suggested, has meant um, far more forgiveness on the part of victims than any kind of sense of justice that has emerged from this. But that has only been one of the mechanisms, one of the terrains of the debate and of the, the field through which you create a new society out of the conflicts of the past. Uh, the other, of course, that we've had an opportunity to think about is the whole process of land restitution as another kind of mechanism. And we know how complex and how difficult this process has been. That has recently been reopened. And it's been reopened, interestingly, in a way that goes beyond 1913 as the original cutoff date uh, for which people could submit claims. And of course, previously, that excluded all of the land that became used for mining in the 19th century. And um, it also excluded um, certain dispossessions before the 20th century uh, from any kind of reckoning in this regard. And the reopening of the land restitution process, I think, is going to be very interesting as we, as we look at it. Um, but if, it's also been argued that the very process of land restitution potentially inaugurates new forms of privilege as the new society is being made. Um, it's, it's also been quite interesting how uh, remaking a society has brought forth just how, just how intransigent the past is when the future is built on the basis of the the very concepts of the past, dressed up as the new. And so as South Africa styles itself as a multicultural nation, as a society of many cultures, it draws on the very ideas of colonial anthropology 
and of native affairs to imagine that future society. And so the old language of tribe and race become the language, uh, becomes the language of many cultures. But I'm not going to go into those kinds of issues, but let us just accept that those issues are on the table as well. I want to talk to you about a very specific set of, of, of challenges and questions that I have been involved with more directly. Um, and that is the, the project of how to remake the museum in a post-apartheid society. And this has happened in a number of ways. It's happened through um, drawing upon uh, the museum as an institution of modernity to, to rethink certain kinds of claims. And so we've got new forms of museum that are not collections. We have new forms of museum that imagine new forms of personhood. And I'll come back to that right at the end. Because what we've also been dealing with is how do you, how do you address the 19th century museum in a post-colony? How do you make, what do you do with the legacies of racial science and anthropology as you imagine a new nation? And the one thing that has become very clear is that you cannot make a new nation on the basis, on, on utilizing the Anthropology Museum. The Anthropology Museum in South Africa is in a, faces a very interesting set of dilemmas. And so, I mean, one of the interesting things that has happened in the National, National Museum in Cape Town, previously characterized by the old classificatory division between anthropology and cultural history, is that they have demolished that classificatory division and created a new division of what they call social history. And the ongoing work of uniting those collections previously segregated is not just the collections management process, but it is an epistemic process of how you imagine a new society. As we were going through those debates, and in uh, South Africa, much of that debate took place around uh, quite a famous exhibition in the South African Museum in Cape Town, uh, the so-called diorama uh, of uh, life casts that had been made at the beginning of the 20th century by James Drury uh, and the museum director, Louis Peringay, uh, after they had been urged at a conference of the British Association for the Advancement of Science to document the physical features of what was described as these fast disappearing races of human beings. And that inaugurated the cast making project as a project of preservation in a sense, but it was a project of physical anthropology and of racial science through which casts were made of the bodies of farm workers and shepherds, uh, mainly in the Northern Cape, um, which came to, to stand for the physical features of people described as Bushmen and Hottentots. And um, a colleague and I had been called into the McGregor Museum in Kimberley to assist them with a new exhibition that they were developing. And our interest in new exhibitions quickly shifted to an interest in their history of collecting. And scouting through their acquisitions register um, and reading the correspondence of this museum, it became, some very interesting issues emerged. It became very clear that the McGregor Museum was founded on human remains collections. Not only human remains collections of long dead people, perhaps excavated by archeologists or uh, paleoanthropologists, 
human remains of people who had recently died. Um, and not only that, but the, the basis of the South African Museum in Cape Town becoming a modern museum of the new nation at the beginning of the 20th century, as the new South Africa was being made, as the nation of South Africa was being born in 1910, was also the dead Khoisan body of freshly dead people, of people who had been alive in the 20th century. And it also transpired that there were a number of Europeans also on the scene in the Northern Cape, in the Khalakhadi, across the border, across the, the, the border of the Kharib River, in what is today southern Namibia and in southern Bichwana land, who were on collecting expeditions, one of whom was Rudolf Puch, who engaged a number of people to search for the remains of dead Bushmen. And out of this, it, it emerged that not only did a number of bodies enter museums in Europe and in South Africa of people who had recently died, but there's also evidence of deals and of contracts over the remains of people who had not yet died, whose bodies were bespoken for by museums. And so the, the modern museum in South Africa has quite an atrocious legacy. And so uh, Martin Legasic and I wrote this book, Skeletons in the Cupboard, in, published in 2000, that was about making an argument for, uh, for the place of human remains in, the, in, a, in a museum system for a new nation. Essentially making an argument that all human remains that were collected on this basis of violent uh, appropriation all human remains that had entered for the purposes of racial research needed to be returned. And today in Cape, in Cape Town, a meeting is taking place about developing a national policy that will try to adopt the, the policy that been, has been adopted in the National Museum in Cape Town, as a result of which human remains have been deaccessioned and placed in a special collection until such time as a national de policy determines the basis of such returns. Because return is not an event. I'm going to suggest to you these are not events. These are projects. They are long-term projects. And that returns, sometimes called repatriations and so forth, and we need to discuss the politics of each of these concepts that describe these processes, suggests to us what the museum of the future can look like. And so it happened that we wrote this book mainly as a contribution to the debate about the museum in South Africa with information along the way about an Austrian history of collecting in Southern Africa that resulted in a return that took place in 2012. And the story of that process goes back to 2008, when our colleagues in Austria were celebrating the career of their founding father, the very same Rudolf Puch, who was collecting in Southern Africa, and who also became the first professor of anthropology in Austria, and who's widely regarded as the founding father of a number of disciplines, uh, ethnomusicology and so forth, because on that expedition on which, at which human remains were collected, he took sound recording equipment into the field, he took film camera into the field, and so the, you, you have the fact that a number of cultural institutions in Vienna were created, constituted, on the basis of these collecting legacies. And so, um, 
we got invited to the celebratory conference of Rudolf Perch, and I promise you, you can go and have a look at the website of this uh, celebrations. It is called Digital Perch. You can go and look at how the phonogram archive, the, all of these um, uh, museums, including the one to which the former director of this institution went to become the director, so they're all sort of interconnections here that we can talk about in Europe. Um, suddenly they were faced with this dilemma because the evidence that we had about this history of collecting could speak to the evidence that they had about the entry of these collections into their museum. And the South Africans didn't have these collections, these, these records, because at the beginning of the 20th century, there was some kind of concept of how incorrect this was on a moral basis or a political basis. What was happening at the beginning of the 20th century was that South Africa was becoming a modern nation. South Africa went through a process of scientization of, of what, what we call the South Africanization of science, in which it was laying claim to its own scientific ability to hold these remains. And so an inquiry took place at the beginning of the 20th century into the collecting activities of Perch so that it is possible to name individuals whose bodies entered these collections. And so we started with the remains of a couple regarded during the return as a married couple, uh, Klaas and Troy Pinar, and we have the dates on which their bodies were disinterred from their graves, the circumstances under which they had died a few months before, and of, of how their remains were uh, broken at the knees, pressed into a wine barrel, that was filled with salt, placed onto an ox wagon, along with the cultural artifacts and recordings and other, uh, uh, other items that then made their way by ox wagon, by train, and by ship to Vienna. And immediately, when it became clear that the remains that they had, and we have a record on that side, of when the remains were, were macerated, uh, how they were deployed in the collection, how they were researched, what, what publications they gave rise to, um, and so forth. It became, it became clear that this, was gained, this needed to be a case for return. And eventually a long drawn out process occurred of two governments negotiating with each other over these returns with the South Africans saying that we might start with, with the class in Troy Pinar, but that we need to do an inventory of the entire collection, arrive at a jointly agreed inventory of the human remains and the associated cultural artifacts, and talk about what the future relationship will be between Austrian collecting institutions and the Northern Cape the region from which they collected, which also happens to be the poorest province uh, in South Africa. Unfortunately, that process got stalled. And the Austrians, of course, have put forward a proposal of a cultural agreement between South Africa and Austria that focuses on opera um, as a means for taking forward that discussion. So this process, un has unfortunately, uh, gotten stalled. But it raises for us, I think, some very interesting questions. It has suggested a methodology for how you do a return. Because knowing Klaas and Troy Pinar's names, knowing the, the dates of their deaths, knowing the history of their collection and their entry into an Austrian museum collection, under the banner of the Academy of Science, it was possible for us to make an argument for the very first time in a return from a European museum 
for remains to be returned not as objects, but as people. Because European law does not allow for returns of human remains as people. They can only be returned as objects. And so it, it was possible for us to provide the information to the diplomats to be able to do the negotiations so that this can happen. And you see some of the, these are images of some of the ceremonies and the processes that took place through which the remains of Klaas and Troipina were returned. What makes South Africa interesting on this question is that South Africa is not just a colonial victim. South Africa is also a colonial perpetrator. South Africa had colonial authority over Namibia. And I promise you, Namibia became a domain of collecting for South African museums. And so it is possible for us, it has been possible for us in you know, doing an inventory of remains in South African museums to list all of the remains that need to go back to Namibia. And so when we think about these questions of repair and of the legacies of violence, we need to think about how these legacies are overlaid by each other so that they go back to some of the some of the primary social experiences of violence that linger on centuries after they were made so that I'm able to come to the Netherlands and speak in a variety of Dutch, as I sometimes like to do, that suggests that the colonial legacies that Paul spoke about earlier go further back in time than Dutch history presupposes. If you go to Dutch colonial museums such as this one, um, you do not find any evidence of that history. You find very little evidence, and there is very little evidence of that in, in, in public memory uh, in, in, in the Netherlands. And I want to suggest finally that in one of those negotiations that I was very privileged to be able to be a part of, when the Dutch Minister of Science heard about these details, she exclaimed that she felt very fortunate that there weren't any collections of stolen rock art in their museum. And of course, one was able to point out exactly where that rock engraving was on display and when it was collected and on what ox wagon it left the Northern Cape on. And because when claims are made utilizing the instruments, that, the international instruments that you have, you can't just do so through a political argument. You do so on the basis of very specific research. And it raises for us what the position is of the associated cultural materials that are connected to the remains of the dead. But it raises for us more generally what we mean by returns of artifacts. And that is not just a question of relocating cultural materials. It is a question about opening for, up for discussion what the museum of the future or what the post-museum looks like. Thank you.